This is the TSG Multimedia Podcast for April of 2024. We're sponsored this month by Podomatic and the TSG Train Crew on Patreon. Thank you very much. Welcome to the longest continuously running train-related podcast, now running in our 15th continuous year. I'm John, your host, and we have a doozy this month. March turned out to be quite busy, including a couple trips to Niles Canyon Railway, a Coast Division meet at one of our area's grand-scale railroads, along with some 7.5-inch gauge live steamers, some layout visits, Uh, we also went to Reedley for a rail fest, two layout tour shoots, an op session, and more. So, let's get started. Today is March 2nd. We're here at Niles Canyon quite early. We're going to do some documenting of the Clover Valley number four's 100th birthday celebration here today. And it's supposed to be pretty rainy. It's not really too rainy right now, but hopefully it'll stay that way. We'll see what happens, but I'll be back later with more as it happens. Okay, so it's a while later, and there's a lot more prep done on the engine. And uh, we've done some filming of uh, people talking here about this. Uh, That's Gerald behind me. He's the one that's going to be talking on the uh, video. And so, uh, you know, we're just working, and it's fun to see an engine this old getting ready to go out and make people happy. closer it gets to the time, the appointed time, the further out the locomotive gets to the point when they finally hook it up to the train and take off to Sinol. And uh, we're going to go up to Sinol to try to catch that, catch the train arriving there. So should be good. Okay, so it's a little bit while later and they're going to be leaving the yard here real soon and heading up to a place called Sinol, which is where they're going to be doing all the speeches and stuff so this is almost like a mini episode of chasing trains for us locomotive made it up to Sinol there it is 100 years old doesn't look a day over 99 So they just did all their speeches. They're going to let people ride the train now. They'll probably hang out. It's still starting to pour rain, though. I don't know how long we're going to be out here. But there a lot of nice people today. You know that whole thing about making new friends and seeing old friends. It happened today. We even had some, as I mentioned before, had some, you never know who you're going to run into. I just didn't get them on camera for the podcast. I ended up riding the train after all. My friend Alan from the steam department says, hey, I didn't get to talk on the video that you're making to document the event today. So we took a ride in the Pickering Caboose, which I've seen around the yard, but never actually ridden in. And it turns out this piece of equipment is also somewhere close to 100 years old and is, I think, the only one that runs on a track anywhere, which is kind of cool. So we have the Clover Valley number four turning 100. We have this thing that's probably turning 100 and pretty soon I'm going to turn 100 so just might as well celebrate the whole thing so this is Alan he's one of the main contacts I have with the steam department and you wanted to tell us something cool about this caboose didn't you yeah I just wanted to talk a little bit we're sitting up in uh, the cupola of Pickering Lumber Company number four. It's a caboose that was built by the Pickering Lumber Company in the 1930s. We don't have an exact date. Um, At that point, the Union train crews were upset because they were still sitting outside on top of log cars watching the rear of the train. It was dangerous. So the Lumber Company built a series of these short cabooses. This one is actually on a frame of an old log car that they chopped the middle out of and then put the two ends together, welded them together and reinforced it. 
So one of the interesting things about this car, you know, Pickering Lumber Company, like a lot of lumber companies, they use regular air brakes, uh, but they also use straight air. And typically they didn't use train air most of the time. They would use straight air because it's easier to control, easier to keep constant pressure on the brake system going downhill. So when you look at this caboose, you have a gauge here, which most cabooses have a gauge for train air. The black needle is the train line, normal air, 90 pounds of pressure. This, the red needle is actually for the straight air. Now we don't run straight air, so there's no pressure on it. But you can see there's two pipes, a red pipe and a black pipe, one for regular air, one for straight air. There's dump valves for both. Um, so this is a unique, unique thing for a logging railroad. You, you wouldn't find this on a mainline railroad. And I guess I should explain what straight air means. Your regular train brake works on a valve in the locomotive. Uh, the train line, depending on the railroad, it usually is 90 pounds of air. To set the air brakes on the train, you actually make a reduction. So your first service is six pounds. So you pull the train bait down six pounds. There's valves on the cars that sense the train line pressure dropping and they take air out of the service reservoir and use it to apply the brakes. So they take air out of a tank and put it into a piston which pushes against the wheels to set the brakes. So that's a reduction system. And, this, and the nice thing about that is when, say, a car, the train breaks in half. The train line goes instantly to zero. All the cars go into emergency. The train stops. So straight air works differently. You're actually applying pressure from the locomotive to the brake cylinders directly. So in the engine, there'll be a straight air handle and the engineer will decide he wants 20 pounds of pressure in the brake cylinders and he sets that valve to 20 pounds and that's what goes through this line to each brake cylinder directly. Uh, the disadvantage to that is if the train does break, you won't have any air in those cylinders and the cars will run away. But the advantage is when you're going down long steep grades like a logging company has, you set the brakes at 20 pounds and they stay at 20 pounds. So just a unique thing about this caboose and logging lines in general. And this is a remnant that reminds us all of that unique service. So something kind of cool happened. Uh, one of the people that came with one of the people that I know here uh, wanted to check out the Krauss Mafia. That's the KM, right? You've been seeing models of that Southern Pacific engine behind me coming out lately and and the, the train just came down here too coming in uh, i think on ho scale lately someone's in the process of releasing those or something like that well they have one here and it's the only one left in existence this is one of those times when you never know who you're going to run into i have mike and garrett here from railtown 1897 and since we're all here i thought i'd ask them if they would talk about What's happening up at Railtown? Because I think that's relevant to the channel. So what's happening at Railtown? Well, coming up uh, probably the weekend this airs, uh, we have our opening weekend, our season starts. So April 6th and 7th, we're starting our uh, excursion train season for the year. We're running uh, four trains a day. We have some equipment we're going to pull out that isn't normally pulled out. Uh, Shea locomotive is going to be outside of the roundhouse. A couple of passenger cars are going to be on display that you can walk through and tour. Um, and a bunch of other interpretive activities. Cool. Yeah. That's your department, interpretive activities. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be, uh, we'll also be doing blacksmith demonstrations that day, and uh, I'll be heading that up. Um, I've been taking it upon myself the last year or so to learn how to do that, and now we're trying to develop a volunteer program for that. Uh, so that's, I guess that's another thing that we could talk about is uh, we're always on the lookout for volunteers. If you happen to be within the area of Jamestown, California, and you're looking for something to do that's train related, we're always open for uh, new folks to come on in. So. Keep us in mind. And uh, hopefully sometime this year, 
We're looking to have uh, CR number three back in steam. Uh, it's been a long time coming, but uh, we're getting there very slowly. But like I said, going back to the volunteerism thing, uh, the more people we have, the closer we get, uh, and the faster we get it done. So. Uh, yeah, I guess that's it's it. it's man hours, right? It's all man hours, and it's on museum time right now. But that's all dependent on the people we have. So, yeah. This is another example of you never know who you're going to run into. So we're up here doing this thing at Niles, and yesterday I was talking to Garrett with a text message, and he says, "Hey, I'm going to bring this guy with me," and this is this guy. His name's Velo, <laughs> Velo Nicolau. And he did the Trains Unlimited, well, some episodes of Trains Unlimited, which was a show on the History Channel, right? Mm -hmm. So tell them how, how do you end up with these guys. Wanted to go skiing in the Sierras. God decided to give us a blizzard instead, so I had to find other things to do. I was driving back down from the mountains, and I saw a sign for a town called uh, Jamestown. I go, there's something there I should go see. And I pulled in and kind of found the back door and said, hi, can I wander around? And then we decided to come here with that group of people, and we met these people at Niles, and yeah, it pays to, to, to get out there and get out from behind the phones, everyone, right? And now he's gonna go to Santa Clara to the train shop and meet even more people. So who knows, you may, you may who knows where you'll end up this week. Have fun foaming. That's it. That's a wrap on today. They ended up doing some other stuff with the engine, but we're going home after lunch and a bunch of you never know who you're going to run into. Uh, overall, great day. It was really actually a good event and saw a lot of people that I've been meaning to talk to for quite some time. That usually happens at these events. And uh, hope you had a good time tagging along. We'll catch you on whatever's next. Hi, we're doing something re train related today. I came back, or we came back to Niles Canyon to record kind of a tour of the equipment here, plus whatever Henry Baum, the president of the PLA right now, wants to talk about. And this is going to be dual purpose. We're going to present it as the tour for our virtual PCR convention attendees and then some part of it or maybe all of it will also be included on the channel here sometime in the future but after the convention so if you want to see it sooner your best bet would be to come to the convention virtually and it should be fun uh, I don't know what exactly he's going to be showing us here but if anything seems relevant to the podcast I will bring it to you here later so going to do some drone shots now and We'll talk later. So we've been here for a while now and shot, I think, most of what we're going to shoot here. But I'm inside the old Great Northern dining car that Henry has been instrumental in the restoration of this. And he was showing us all kinds of really cool stuff. Like this mural behind me is something that is kind of unique to this sort of car. He's looking for help trying to restore it or get some kind of a replica made that can go over that. Uh, it's really interesting all the things that you learn about how these things were designed in order to work the way they did and serve the purpose that they served. Everything is very purpose-built. So it's uh, always an interesting thing. And because they're as old as they are, a lot of people aren't around that know about this stuff. So a lot of it is figuring things out. So there's sort of an archaeology to it. But anyway, that's... This part, I'll probably come back on later to talk a little bit more about this behind-the-scenes stuff that you don't get anywhere else except here on the podcast. You just build a kitchen like so there's no thinking involved. You just be loading yeah. that with bread, loading it with bread. And, and the, when the steam went away, they had to add a hot water heater. So, so they had to replumb the entire kitchen sure. for that. And, We're down at the Niles Y. We finished recording the video. I'm just gonna put the drone up and get some aerial shots of this area to go with the video. 
but this is going to be a really good video for you to watch because it's kind of behind the scenes right the video will explain exactly what the plans are for this area and there are a lot of plans that are pretty exciting so that's it for now and we'll catch you on the next segment of the video on March 9th, we had a special episode of TSG Live Talking Trains, where I was joined by Paul and Trevor from the Fern Creek and Western Garden Railroad that I've been sharing with you here on the channel for the past nine or ten years. The ultimate Fern Creek and Western layout tour video came out that same morning as the featured content for the weekend, and we wanted to make the final send-off one to remember. So if you have a chance to catch both of those videos, they're well worth your time. The layout tour video is the most complex and comprehensive layout tour video I've produced in the past 10 years. And the live show featured a presentation with a lot of vintage photos, not only of the layout, but of Trevor and Paul doing things with Eric. Both videos from this day rank high on my favorites list. We're doing something train related today. Uh, there's a PCR Coast Division meetup at a place called Tilden Park. And there's a 15 inch gauge railway here, as well as some narrower gauge live steamers that we're supposed to look at. And this is one of the benefits of being a member of the PCR of the NMRA, really. And this is also one of the things, one of the reasons I think why to join the NMRA because if you have a good division like I do, you get to do neat things like this. So we're gonna check out these steam trains here today. And then there's a bunch of layout tours available in the afternoon. So it's all people we know. And my intention is to check out the steam trains and then go to the layouts because like I said, we know the people and it'll be visiting friends. So here we go. Sunny day, we'd have over 2,000 people arrive on the days back in the 60s. to do is make it look like a five inch scale uh, dance organ instead of a full size military organ. And so what it is, it's standing in a drop floor down here. It's already on its trucks, you can hardly see it. But it's got a drop floor and it's actually standing at the base of that steel right across the tracker bar. And when the vacuum is broken, that's what plays the pipe. And it's um, mechanically pumping vacuum and pumping air for the pipes. This is pretty cool. We've been riding the train around the uh, 
Redwood Valley Railroad here for the past, I don't know, since we got here. And they even made a chance for us to do some run-bys and special shots, which was kind of unexpected. And uh, I think everybody here is having a pretty good time. I'm going to raise my camera up here so you can see behind me and see all the people on the train. As part of our excursion here today with the PCR Coast Division, we're going to go see something called the Golden Gate Live Steamers. And this is like a seven and a half inch gauge ride on trains, I think. Yeah. And it uh, should be interesting. I'll come back with an update on that. So here's what we're talking about. Well, I've been coming up to the Redwood Valley Railroad since 1973 when there weren't any redwoods up here, so to speak. I was five years old and, that year. Yeah, okay, and uh, yeah, I put in a lot of time on locomotives up here and a lot of time on the wrong end of a shovel and uh, <laughs> a whole lot of things on that. It's just an absolutely great railroad. If you can get out and see it, uh, I encourage you to do it. So, Operation yeah. Horse Department. So in case you're wondering, Redwood Valley Railroad, which is what we were just riding, and the Golden Gate Live Steamers, which I just mentioned a few minutes ago on here, They're in the same place at Tilden Park up here. And I guess this is technically Orinda, but it's in the Berkeley Hills, basically. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, thanks for okay. being on, Dave. It's good to see you up here. Well, you bet. Glad to be here, John. Oh, yeah. Well, have fun. level on the ground but in 08 when they finished it they made the interloop of figure eight so this is another one of those times where you don't know who you're going to run into this is matt petak he's been on the channel i think at least once before when we were talking about the z-scale layout at the national train convention in 2019 he said if you're not into trains you should be <laughs> And I just ran into Matt a couple of days ago when we were at Niles uh, doing that thing with Henry Baum. And I knew he was going to be here, so we, I waited till here because I've never been here before. And I want him to tell you what this place is and what it's all about. So this, that's your cue. Well, excellent, John. Thank you so much. And we're really glad you were able to come out and join us here. We're up at the Golden Gate Live Steam Club here up in Tilden Park. This is one of the oldest uh, running live steam organizations here in the U.S. It's been uh, in existence since 1936. Uh, previously, it was in the Redwood Regional Park, but relocated up here in the early 1970s. So we've been in this location here since uh, 1972 when the, the rails were first laid here. We've got uh, about two and a half acres of land and about a, a mile of track up here. We have a couple of different gauges of track up here. We've got members with live steam locomotives and trains uh, that run on four and three quarter inch gauge track. Uh, seven and a half inch gauge track is the most popular, uh, but we also have some of the smaller uh, three inch for uh, our elevated track. We've got people who run, as I said, live steam equipment, but we also have club members with uh, electric locomotives, gasoline powered engines. That's a fun way to experience the hobby and a slightly larger size. And I found out that those steam engines, like the one that we rode behind earlier, operate off of propane, which I thought was kind of interesting. So anything that burns, right, that makes heat. Can Pretty much. Um, yeah. Most of the people these days are, are using propane because, well, it's it's easy and, and relatively safe. But we do have club members that still run their locomotives off coal. And we even have one or two uh, wood burners. Those tend to be a lot more challenging to, to manage. You need spark arresters on the, the smokestacks. Uh, especially come the summer months here in California. But, but the wood burners smell so good. Oh, yeah. wood burners and coal burners, they, they evoke that nostalgic smell when, when you go past. Propane just doesn't have that same experience. I got distracted. Someone started a, an engine back there, and it was one of those squirrel moments for me. I'm going to go see what it was. Thank you for, <laughs> You're for sharing. John, right. thanks so much for coming out and joining us here.
This is another example of you don't know who you're going to run into. This is Richard Kroll. You can see him on the video of the Cal, what is it, Cal Central or California Cal, California Central? Central. Right. That was the layout that is in the old old depot from the South Pacific Coast Railroad at Agnew in San Jose or Santa Clara, I guess. And he was the guy telling us all about it. Well, he does this too, like so many people do all these things. So you're going to tell us about this chain, but I'm going to get behind the camera and get closer so they can actually hear you. Okay. I just wanted to show them the whole thing. So, Okay, so this is the ultimate insanity. <clears throat> I started this over 30 years ago. A friend of mine and I were building a pair of them. His is almost running. I finished this one in about June of 2023. It's a sort of freelance 20 ton class A shea of about eh, roughly 1920 vintage. It's largely scratch built. There's a few commercial parts. Most of the engine the castings were commercial. My friend and I scratch built the rest of the pieces on it. Propane fired. Gotta love steam whistles. The caboose is a totally freelance car. The caboose body portion is patterned after a Westside Lumber Company caboose. The rest of the car is totally fictitious. The car body carries the propane tank for this. But, uh, it was fun building it. I'm glad it's over. <laughs> So that's it for here, but we're not really done because part of this event, today's proceedings, includes going to some open houses for layouts. The first layout we visit belongs to Jim Radke. It's the BNSF Pink Lady Subdivision. This is a modern era HO scale layout built for operations. As you can see, it's still under construction. And one of the great things Jim has done here is he made sure to make very wide aisles. So this is our next layout. This is John Cockle. Tell us about the layout. So this is the Rio Bravo in Santa Fe uh, in scale. It, uh, it's a fictional railroad that runs from uh, Bakersfield west to a port on the coast in kind of the Morro Bay-ish area. It started out as an extension of the Santa Fe. And then my son growing up here in Berkeley, of course, uh, the Union Pacific is his. He never knew the Santa Fe. It doesn't mean anything to him, but he loves the Union Pacific. So the UP has negotiated trackage rights uh, on the Rio Bravo in Santa Fe. And then he likes more of the modern equipment and, and a lot of this stuff, so this is some of his stuff here. The railroad started in this area from about here to the wall. That's an old HO scale table that I found um, that was, I don't know, on the scrap heap down at the, at the Golden Gate, or Golden State. Museum in Point Richmond. I said, oh, I could turn that into an end scale. So we had just the circle, and that was good for a couple of years. And then, of course, he had the big idea that we'd punch a hole through the wall and go into the garage over here. So we negotiated an expansion yeah. with mom, and she was pretty good because she knew that he was into it so much. And that this town is called Two Chains because you see, there's two chains that hold it up, uh, hanging it from the ceiling. So that's the town of Two Chains there. <laughs> Uh, there's a two guns in Arizona and uh, two rock up near Petaluma. So this is two chains, right? So, so we negotiated and we expanded in, into the other side here and, and the rear Bravo's over here. And we got a big port. I've really been trying to focus on this side in the last year, year and a half on the scenery. So it used to be just a whole bunch of pictures and stuff here on the wall. I took that down and, and did the backdrop and, and painted some of that and then uh, the river i just did a, oh maybe last summer august september mm -hmm. first time i'd ever done water before so that was kind cool. of an adventure this is the last layout we're going to look at today this is chuck araftic's boston and albany you can see a full layout tour of this video here on the channel i've linked it in 
the description of this podcast. So let's go in and see what's new at Chuck's. So we're in Chuck's layout. I know this doesn't look like a layout. We're going to look at that in a minute. But I haven't seen Chuck. I haven't been here, I think, since we did yeah. the video, right? We did the video. Yeah, that's three years ago. About three years ago? Yeah. No, we've seen Chuck here and there, you know, PCR events. Elsewhere, you know, not like, in my basement. Right? But this is exciting because this is the layout. I mentioned on the way in here that there's a layout tour. This is that part of that layout that we already shot. And this whole thing here is what's going to be in the room that we're standing in. And it's, it seems like a really cool plan. I'm excited. I, I don't know if you can tell, but yeah. tell people about this extension because we only touch on it really briefly yeah. on the layout tour. That's true. But yeah. you're making progress because you have these beautiful buildings that I'm assuming were scratch built, right? Yes, right. Yeah. Which I'll show you pictures of these buildings too because yeah. they're amazing. Yeah. But talk about this because that's the really yeah. exciting part. The buildings just show that you're serious. That, that's right. I'm, right. I'm, and making progress. Yeah. Well, this is the original layout. This is basically 100% complete or 99% complete. There's a duck under right here, a temporary loop. As you come in, you have to duck under that. But my intention is to expand into the room we're in, the other half of this basement, and taking the temporary loop out and bringing it this way. Having these tracks, instead of coming around that way, they'll go straight on through into this room. Instead of going around this way, the tracks will uh, come in this into this room this way. Uh, just like the prototype in Albany, the freight will go this way, passengers go that way. And they join back up again over here at Post Road Crossing. Which is going to be over here, Which right? will be over there. And so this will be downtown Albany. There's a huge four-track tr uh, truss bridge. That'll be right through here. And then the big central warehouse, the uh, uh, Union Station the Delaware and Hudson building, the post office, the commissary, meat packing houses, and the Delaware and Hudson Railroad also comes in here, and they come in from this corner, and they are on the lower level of the station. So we'll have a little piece of Delaware and Hudson. It just might be stationary, but it'll be representative. The Hudson River is right through here. This is where you cross the Hudson River. And eventually this will totally link up and uh, almost double the size of the current layout. Now, some other people came in, so you're yeah. going to have to greet them. But I'm going to take you into the other room and just give you an idea of what you can see on the layout tour. Right, and just when you thought it couldn't get any better. It's good at night. All right, so it's quite a bit later, and I've had time to reflect on the day and just have to say, in order, the uh, Redwood Valley Railroad at Tilden Park was really amazing. That's a place that I've been wanting to go to for years and just haven't got around to it, and it was probably the main reason why I wanted to go today. I mean, simply due to that fact, it's like, oh, we're having an outing there and we're going to see some behind the scenes stuff, you know, sign me up. I've wanted to get there anyway. And uh, this morning I felt when I woke up that I didn't really want to go. I was kind of feeling tired and dragging, but I'm really glad that we went. And I'm hoping to be able to get up there and do a video documenting the history and their operation as well. Then we went to the live steamers, which is something that I've known about. And it wasn't as much of a bucket list thing as the uh, Redwood Valley, to be honest, but it was still really cool. And there are people there that I know from other places. It, it seems to happen a lot. You know, people from layout tours or people that are into trains are into all kinds of trains, you know, big and small. And just the fact that, you know, Matt Petak that you met and Richard Crawl also who had that Shea there uh, were there. I know, well, I know Matt from a Z scale layout originally and Richard from an HO scale layout. And they're over there doing these seven and a half inch gauge live steamers too. Well, how cool is that? And then the layouts. Now, we've seen Jim's layout before and it's really neat to see how much 
progress he's made on it. I, I love his wide aisles and the light in there is very abundant, which I love, you know, as a person who does video, you gotta love lots of lights. And then uh, John Cockle's end scale layout, I had never been to, and I've been wanting to get up there and see that because one, I like end scale, two, it's for operations. And ever since I had a chance to operate with John at the uh, central Vermont layout that we did the op session last year, ever since I you know met him in person, I, I've known him on social media and known of him for a long time. And then I found out that he had a layout. So ever since I knew that, I've been wanting to see it. So that was really cool. And I like what he's done with the space that he has there. And then finally, Chuck Raftick and his Boston and Albany. It's just, that is one of the most gorgeous layouts in this entire area. I mean, I would put that easily on a top five of the Bay Area of, of layouts. And Chuck is just a, such a nice guy. And I've been wanting to see him again. So just all in all, it was a really great day. And I'm so glad that we went because it would have been really easy to just stay home this morning and kind of waste the day. I mean, it wouldn't be wasted because I do need rest, but I'm so glad that we went. And, you know, I really want to thank a couple of people for making this thing happen. One, uh, Phil Edholm, our regions or our division superintendent, puts these things uh, together, you know, gets them in the calendar. But in this case, my understanding is that John Cockle did a lot of the planning for this, if not most of it. So uh, really hats off to you, John, for doing a great job putting together really what was a lot of very interesting things to see and do today. So just a great day overall. I'm really glad that we got to go. And, you know, I'm really glad that I got to share it with you here on the podcast because uh, it's a lot of stuff that you just don't see every day. And, you know, that's really what I'm into, sharing the kind of stuff that you don't see every day. So uh, that's all I have to say, Bit, you know, a long wrap up, but there was a lot to talk about. And I'll catch you on the next update, which will happen pretty soon. I were doing something train related today. We're out at the Sacramento Model Railroad Historical Society or SMH, SMRHS. This is a layout that I've had on my radar to do a video about for a long time. And we've been kind of planning it for like three or four years now and finally getting around to it. So it should be good. Looking forward to uh, sharing this one because it's pretty cool. It's an operations based layout. And uh, they have a CTC machine here. And what's interesting about it is that it's the original Western Pacific CTC machine that worked in this area that they actually model. They also have another room with a narrow gauge HO scale layout. So there's a reason to come back and do another layout tour here sometime. So we just finished finally. <laughs> this was gonna be done, I think three hours ago. That's what he thought. But these always take longer than you think they're gonna take. And I think we covered everything we wanted to cover on the standard gauge HO layout. Like I said a minute ago, we have a whole narrow gauge layout kind of next door here that we can look at some other time. But for now, we covered this and I learned a lot about the layout. And this was Mike, our host of this layout. What do you think? You look really energetic, like you're ready to do some more. Oh yeah, I'm ready for another couple hours of this. Can we do this, not go home? Sure. Yeah, how about we come back tomorrow? We'll do it all over again. It's my new job. <laughs> all right, so that's it for now. We'll catch you on the next segment, which is gonna be probably tomorrow when I go to Reedley. <laughs> this is the uh, this is what I told you about yesterday that was gonna happen today. I'm at Reedley, California, little town east of Fresno. And this is the Reedley Rail Fest at Hillcrest Tree Farm. Came with my friends, Kevin and Curtis, and already have seen a whole bunch of people we know here. It's gonna be a lot of fun today.
This is one of those instances of you never know who you'll run into. This is Molly Engelman, who's the president of, what's it called now? The Over Overfair Pacific Railroad Society. Right. And in case you don't remember or don't know, that was the Swanton Pacific. Originally, it burned in this horrendous fire in the Santa Cruz Mountains a few years ago. And they finally got a hold of all the equipment and they're working to restore it. Why don't you tell people about that? Because I think it's a great yes. story. So uh, the Overfair locomotives are at 19 inch gauge, one third scale. So we're very unique. There are no other 19 inch gauge railroads in the world that we know of. And these locomotives are over a hundred years old. They were built in 1913, 1914 for the 1915 uh, World's Fair in San Francisco. Do you, see what I, do you see what I did there? Yes, I see that. That's <laughs> wonderful. You can see our logos. You can see our website, overfairpacific.com. has a lot more information about who we are, what we're doing, the history of the locomotives. And we have a new home at the Santa Margarita Ranch in Southern California. I guess it's not really Southern it's California. It's the Central Coast, it's Central I think. Coast. Yeah. I'm, I'm still getting used to the Central Coast idea, which is, it's wonderful. There's so many railroads down there and now we are part of it as well. Uh, there's already the Pacific Coast Railroad on the ranch there at Santa Margarita and we will be there as well now, building from the ground up, putting in track, restoring locomotives and having fun. And what's cool about this, this is one of those things that I talk about on my podcast all the time is you never know who you're going to run into. And I come to these events to see old friends like CJ. I've known him forever. And to meet new friends. Now you're a new friend. So when I see you again, you'll be an old friend. There we go. <laughs> but this is one of the reasons why we do this. And I'm really excited about that whole overfair thing because it was a total loss, basically. And if someone hadn't stepped in to do what your organization or created hadn't created the organization to do what you're doing, they would have just been lost because Cal Poly didn't yeah, seem uh, to, yeah. Yeah, so these these locomotives were, and and the Swanton Pacific Ranch, were donated to Cal Poly in 93, and Cal Poly really took over all of it in 94 uh, after Al Smith passed away. And after the fire, Cal Poly decided that it was not something that they were going to put energy into in rebuilding, and everything was transferred to a nonprofit, which is uh, Vintage Traditions. So Vintage Traditions is at the Santa Margarita Ranch and they actually own the equipment, but our organization, we are Vintage Traditions. They've got tractors, they've got all kinds of all kinds of things, um, but we are specific to the Overfair locomotives. And these are the projects that we are fundraising for and that we are working towards getting operational underneath that Vintage Traditions umbrella. <laughs> Yeah, there's a train going by behind me here. That's the uh, two spot from Billy Jones Wildcat Railroad, which I did a video about a DVD. I think it's the only one that's ever been done about Billy Jones. But you may recall, I did a video here on the channel that was the best of the West, which I think is the group that you're talking about a few years ago. And that's, that's where these are now. And something I want to say that, hold on, I want to let this go by. I don't have my earplugs in, so I can't hear now. But luck so luckily, I can still talk. One of the things that I find interesting about this and what just went by here is people see these things and they think, oh, cute, it's a little train. And they don't realize the amount of work that goes into these things and the amount of history. I believe that locomotive that just went by is over 100 years old now, which if you think about it, it's pretty incredible to think of. And also, I think most of the equipment up at Swanton Pacific was also yes. over 100 years yes. too, right? So all of the, the, almost, almost all of the equipment that was at Swanton was, well, the old all, all the steam equipment, All right? the steam equipment. Yeah. So the, the I should... diesel, the, the, the U25B diesel was built in the 60s. Right. But, and along with a couple of passenger cars. Um, but all of the overfair equipment, which is all of the steam engines, the passenger cars, those were built for that 1915 World's Fair. So right. we're coming up on 110 years. Pretty cool stuff. Thanks so, for going on. Thank you. <laughs>
The other cool thing that's going on here is this is an area at Hillcrest Farms where they've completed this track behind me. This is kind of new. And the last time I was here, they were in the process of building it still. So it was two years ago. And there's a big curved trestle behind the camera uh, in the direction that I'm facing right now talking to you that this is part of it. It traverses to this lower loop from the upper loop that was already here the last time we were here. So we're gonna ride the train later and I'll try to show that to you when we get there. This is another example of you might know who you run into. It's John Dyson, mm -hmm. train crew member from the start. Mm -hmm. I remember, right? Oh, we're gonna get run over by a tractor. We better get out of the way. It's better, huh? Flee, flee, let's go. Something oh, yes. really exciting is happening here at Reedley Rail I, I Fest. My daughter, she expects it to marry to a John has a, never had a churro before. These, so we're gonna we're gonna see what he thinks of the churro. Try that churro. How is it? Do you like donuts? I love donuts. How does that compare to donuts? Not the same. Now you I kinda miss the glazed on the donut, but that's good. Now you know why I like churros. Never had one before. Delicious. I'd give you a, give a thumbs up, but I don't want to do this. Chur it's churros up. Oh. Two churros up. <laughs> hey, this is one of those times when you never know who you'll run into. Uh-oh. Yep, I'm on the train and... I'm guess who, guess who it is? Here, John. Yeah, guess who it is? It's Daniel from uh, Fern Creek and Western fame. And Roaring Camp. And Roaring Camp, too. But for the channel, it's mostly Fern Creek and Western. That's where they remember you for now. Oh, and San Benito Southern. Because you right, worked yeah. on the tracks there. So what do you think about all this? This is an awesome place. I'm going to come back next year for sure. Oh, look who else we ran into. Hey, hey, hey. <clears throat> oh, damn. Hold on. Let's do that. Let's do that again. <laughs> Look who, else, look who else we ran into. Hey. hey, hey. <laughs> it's Fat Albert. Yeah. <laughs> and he came with his son, Paul. <laughs> Wait, is your name Paul or is it Brian? That's Big Paul. That's what the B's were. Oh, Big the B. Paul. I yeah. got it. I thought I thought your dad was Big Paul. Well, today I'm Big Paul. Okay. I'm the only one here. So You're Big Paul and Little Paul. Or maybe Bunyan. Paul Bunyan. Paul Bunyan. B. That works too, yes. Or, or maybe Beavis. <laughs> butthead. Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> this is you guys, Beavis and Butthead. Like father, like son. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> One of the things that I notice out here on this railroad is how good the track work is. It's a very, very smooth ride. They're pretty serious about what they're doing, and it shows. You may recall we were talking on a live show Got to with dinner these first. two guys. These two guys a, a while back talking about what the Fern Creek and Western and how it was like this social group and that we wouldn't get together at Fern Creek and Western again, but we would do other stuff together. And this is one of those things out here at Reedley, having fun at the Reedley Rail Fest. Look how fun, how much fun they're having. It's a little bit later and I'm getting fried right now. Been out here all day. It's been a lot of fun so far, but we're gonna get a sort of a, what we would refer to as a money shot, which is a, a really good shot of something interesting. And you'll see what that is in just a minute.
the only bad part about good things is at the end. And this is coming down to the end of the event here for us. The event really ended earlier for the uh, public in general, but there's always a little bit of playing at the end. So they put together the longest train ever, and that's the, the fun at the end. And we usually stay till that point and ride it. And it was a long train this time. Not sure I've seen one longer anyway. So that's it from Reedley Rail Fest. Uh, might come on later with some additional thoughts, but for now, that's it for me. Signing out from Reedley. On March 20th, we went live with last month's episode of Talking Trains. Murph was here at the Intergalactic Headquarters again, and we were joined by some of the folks who are involved with upcoming events that I'll be either covering on the channel or volunteering to help with in some other way. After that, we invited Mike Osborne onto the show. Mike has been a railroader since 1979, and he has a lot of great stories and information about prototype railroading to learn from. Definitely worth a watch on the replay if you missed us live. I'm planning to have Mike on this month's Talking Trains show as the guest co-host when we talk to Ray Arnott about his photography. I think Ray's best known for his Around the Layout podcast, so I'm looking forward to learning some other things about him that we may not already know about. That should be a good one, and it's happening on the 17th uh, this month, so be on the lookout for that. Hi, we're doing something train-related today. We're at an N-scale layout that's owned by Steve Van Meter. And this is an operations-based layout. We're shooting a layout tour video here. You can see my equipment here in the background. But we're just breaking for lunch, and I wanted to come on before I forget and tell you that we're shooting a video today. So far, it's a lot of fun. It's a great layout. Okay, so I was mentioning earlier that we're filming a layout today, and this is the guy whose layout it is. This is Steve Van Meter, and he has this amazing N-scale layout. Well, I'm not going to say too much about it, because Steve, I want you to tell the viewers, if you don't mind, what you what would you tell them if you had a, 30 seconds to tell the world about your layout? I would uh, tell people that uh, this layout grew like Topsy, that uh, my goals have changed over the uh, years, it uh, wasn't well planned out, and I hopefully made a few errors, but didn't repeat them as I continued to expand uh, the layout. One of the interesting things that I'll say about it is that it's something that I don't think I've seen, or if I have seen it, I didn't know I had seen it, which is that, and you'll have to you'll have to wait for the video to come out to hear about this in full, but there's a piece of layout on this layout that is an old spaghetti bowl on like a four by six or a four by eight. It's just behind the camera here. I'm sizing it up with my eyes that he's incorporated that this piece of layout has to be at least 50 or 60 years old. And it's incorporated into this operations based layout, which I thought was pretty cool. So that's something you're going to have to wait and see when the layout tour comes out. But thank you, Steve, for taking the time with us today. Well, thank you. Hello, we're doing something train-related today. We're back at the rawhide and duct tape for another op session. That's Dave Lovelace's layout. And there's crews pretty much all showed up now. So we're going to get started soon. But I don't know how much I can talk to you about here. But if something comes up that's interesting or fun, I will uh, certainly do that. But later on, I'm going to try to... Someone here watched a video on the channel recently and had a lot of really interesting things to say about it. So I'm going to try to get him on later, maybe maybe at lunchtime. And uh, yeah, should be fun. Things are kind of ramping up now. There's a lot of people operating here today so we decided to team up and our first train is going behind me now and it was a train that was already partial a job that was already partially done and this is something that I, I haven't done here before but what happened was in the last session and Dave has it this way on purpose but in the last session someone already did most of the work 
and we're just returning it to the yard where it's supposed to end up. This is one of the really sort of ingenious things about this layout is it's kind of self-staging. I mean, the, the cards in the in the folder still have to be turned whenever a job is finished or at a certain point so that the destinations are are correct on the on the train but other than that it self stages every time there's very little work for dave to do other than maintaining the layout itself and this is something to think about if you're making a layout to reduce the amount of work that you're going to have to do for op sessions is come up with a plan that you don't have to do uh, you know four hours of staging everything and getting everything ready before each session Hi, this is one of those times when you know who you're going to run into. Charlie is a regular here at the R&D. And he was telling me something earlier about one of our recent layout tour videos of the Fern Creek in Western. And I thought, oh, it was so nice that I'd get him to come on here and talk about it for the podcast. So do you remember what you said? Yeah, well, you know, I saw the uh, the Fern Creek in Western with uh, the two young guys, uh, Trevor and Paul. Trevor and Paul. Um, and I was just so impressed that they were articulate. They described the railroad in a clear way they, with good video. You did a great job editing because uh, there was there were uh, it showed the original uh, railroad, mm -hmm. how it had changed. But more importantly for me, the part I really liked is their connection with Eric. Yes. Right. There was like two generations between these guys, you know, and and Eric was there as a mentor and they looked up to Eric. And I just thought that was fantastic. And it showed it showed how wonderful the whole hobby is. And it's one of the things that I've said on the channel before, and I'll say it again, is one of my favorite stories is the story of how Eric and Paul and Trevor became. Well, I mean, Eric wasn't just a mentor, but also a friend and also almost like a family member so it's kind of cool and that's why it's one of my favorite yeah. stories so to have you tell i didn't ask him he just started <laughs> talking about it and it was just kind of flattering so i wanted to share that and that was about the fern creek and western layout tour so but thanks for sharing it charlie oh, i appreciate my, it my pleasure yeah Keep i mean it up. we're going to still make fun of you inside the layout <laughs> though, so. well don't change okay <laughs> I released a product spotlight recently that featured some covered two-bay hoppers from Bachman, and the comments the video received were a little surprising. It seems that some of the viewers don't understand the concept of what MSRP means, so I wanted to explain it here real quick. MSRP is the manufacturer's suggested retail price. MSRP is almost always higher than the actual price you would pay for a model at your favorite train shop. In the case of Bachman, their MSRP is usually discounted as much as 40 to even 60% off of the MSRP at the point of sale. If it isn't, you might want to choose a different retailer for your purchases. But anyway, I usually mention something about how the MSRP is higher than what you can get the model for if you shop around when it applies on the show, right? On the product spotlights but I don't always remember to include that little disclaimer. So if you're ever watching one of those product spotlight shows and you think the price I'm showing on the screen seems kind of high, pay attention to if I say it's MSRP or if it's a direct from the manufacturer purchase price. The example of the two bay hoppers I'm referencing here had an MSRP of around 50 or $52. At least one of the comments was to the effect that the person commenting would never pay more than $25 or $30 for something like what was shown on the spotlight. Well, that's great, because if you shop around, that's how much you'd find it for. So you might be watching this and thinking, why don't you talk about the actual price instead of the MSRPs? Well, the answer to that is very simple. I'm trying to give you as much objective information as I can on the spotlights. That means showing the models in a way that lets you see the details clearly, or in some cases, lack of details, so that you can see what you're going to pull out of the box if you get one. And since I'm trying to deal with objective info, 
I use the MSRP because the MSRP is set by the manufacturer and it does not vary, right? Purchase prices will vary. It's up to you to shop around and I trust you to do that. You don't need me to tell you where to shop for your trains, do you? Uh, now, one other comment about product spotlights is that I am as positive as I can be whenever I show you a new model. If I notice something good, I like to point it out. If a part came off in the shipping process, I will tell you about it and I'll usually show you how to fix it. If I notice a paint smudge, I'll point that out as well. If I see that the, this is a good one. If I see that the SP locomotive I just unboxed doesn't have one of those fancy prototype specific light packages straight out of the box, I do notice it, right? It's probably the first thing I notice actually. And I'm betting that it's also the first thing you notice. So what's the point of me complaining about it? That would make me a whiner. My job as I see it is to make sure that the models are lit and presented in a way that makes those things obvious to the viewer. So if you notice something missing or inaccurate about a model, and it's not good enough for you the way it comes, you certainly don't have to buy it. If you want it anyway, at least now you know what you'll have to do to make it ready for your layout. My feeling is that you are the only expert that matters for your decision-making process. I'm just some guy running the lights and the camera so that you can see what you're getting. So let me put it this way. This is something that I think about often. Did you know that model manufacturers spend between thirty dollars to $100,000 to bring a piece of rolling stock to the marketplace? It depends how detailed it is, right? So the less detailed, it would be closer to thirty to 50000 And the higher the detail, the higher the cost. Locomotives range in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to bring to market. Again, with detail and complexity being the main drivers of that cost. So, if a manufacturer spent tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars to bring a model to the market, who am I to nitpick them? I'm glad they're doing the majority of the work so that we don't have to scratch build this stuff. Now, if you get your enjoyment from scratch building stuff, stuff that's available on the market, more power to you. I'd bet people who do that kind of model building aren't watching the product spotlights in the first place. Anyway, it's just something to think about. And now for our catches of the month. Our first catch comes from John Dyson, who took this shot at Hillcrest Tree Farm as the sun was setting on the Railfest event you heard about earlier. It's amazing how good the cameras are in the smartphones these days. Thanks for the shot, John, and I hope you had a great time at the event. I know I did. These next shots come from Ethan Doty, who's a volunteer at the Western Pacific Railroad Museum in Portola, California. The first shot is out the porthole of a rotary snowplow, SPMW208, and here it is from the outside. Ethan also sent these shots from an op session at Jim Petro's Rio Grande layout near Reno. I had a chance to meet Jim last year, and I hope to get up there and document his layout sometime in the near future. If you have a train or model catch you'd like to share on this program, please email it to podcast at tsgmultimedia.com. Be sure you own the shots and include the what's, when's, and where's of the shots you send in. So April's going to be another monster of a month for us here. We have three major events, and the first of these events is happening today and tomorrow at the South Bay Historical Railroad Society in Santa Clara. It's the SBHRS Spring Open House, and I talk about the SBHRS Open House every time it comes along because it's one of the best events in the Bay Area. Later this month, we'll be attending the Westside Reunion and Sierra Seminar near Sonora. And then the PCR Annual Convention happens at the end of the month. I have so much work to do on that one that I don't even know where to start. Now, before I figure out where to start, I'd like to invite you to become a member of the TSG train crew. That's what I call our supporters on Patreon. It's as cheap as two bucks a month, and it would help a lot if only a small percentage of our regular viewers would contribute even that low amount. Patrons get early access to the featured content in 4K and without ads. They also get other perks like deals on the models we showcase on product spotlights and behind the scenes access to TSG out in the field. We have a lot of fun together when that happens. So anyway, that's it for this month. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.